Buenos dias, de novo. Good morning, everyone. Here and uh, the ones following us online. Thank you for waiting. My name is Margarida Fernandes. <clears throat> As many of you, I'm a conservation practitioner. I work at the Institute of Nature Conservation and Forests in Portugal. Um bom dia e saudação aos colegas portugueses que nos possam estar a acompanhar aqui e online. Um, I am vice chair of uh, this cost action G Bike, which I will briefly introduce. I'm also a technician of the live project Links Connect, so very happy to, to be here. And this is a collaboration between several projects, which is important and beneficial. So the workshop today is about uh, genomic tools applied to conservation um, of species. And this is to explain a bit how the acronym G-Bike comes from. This is how we see ourselves as a bike with scientists on the back wheel and practitioners in the front wheel. Um, working, uh, we have a management committee and working for physical systems management, trying to apply the knowledge um, of genomics, um, doing some sharing. And these are some of the, the questions we've been working with. Are practitioners interested in learning more about genetic diversity, willing to work more with scientists? Is it possible, we believe so, to include genetic diversity in conservation practice? We have five working groups um, about implementing genetics, monitoring genomics and ecosystem services, biotechnology assessment, knowledge sharing. This is one of the papers that <clears throat> came out last week from one of our group works uh, about genomic technologies for conservation management. So, Really, we're trying to share this knowledge to have the widest um, ap application in conservation worldwide. <clears throat> we cost action just um, give us um, the tools to organize training schools, workshops, and scientific missions. Thank you. This was a training school, just the one before the pandemic in Malta. And during this, this training schools, we have the opportunity practitioners meet gen geneticists in person, um, to just build up this network, update their knowledge, and practitioners also presenting their conservation cases. Um, scientists can have the opportunity also to understand the international conservation tools, such as the Red List and Habitat Directive Report, which conservation practitioners have to deal with and try to, to, to do the best with what genetics can bring. This is some of the things we've done in the last years. We, we published a policy brief, which is available in several sites, translated into 30 languages. It's about genetic variation, a key to adapt to environmental change. It's available online. We also tried to integrate genetic diversity into biodiversity policies, mainly at the European level. We had a very good news last year from the Council of Ministers of Environment, where genetic diversity was explicitly uh, introduced in conservation and the strategy for 2030. We've been working with the CBD delegations. The Convention for Biological Diversity is, is a very wide instrument and involves all countries. And GBIC has established national contacts, um, participated in SUBSTA documents, revisions, and uh, we organized six webinars online to present gene genetic diversity indicators after a, a publication of Oban et al. that was out 2020 as well. So when we are asked into inside our community of G bikers <clears throat> about conservation themes which were important at the European wide scale, these are some of the themes that came up. And uh, 
Among them, large carnivore coexistence came up, small populations problems, loss of genetic diversity, monitoring, um, connectivity, invasive species, hybridization. So these are some of the things that will be covered today, I hope. And uh, so I think it will be useful um, in general. This is us. This is just my last community uh, trying to reinforce the, this link between scientists and practitioners. It's our site. And um, that's it for me, really. I will uh, just uh, introduce, I think, the next presenter. You can check us on uh, this site. Hello. I'm Mike. The microfilm is a molecular ecology is interested in studying the demographic and evolutionary processes affecting populations, species, ecosystems of conservation concern. This group is based in Cardiff University, <coughs> Wales, um, and is focused on understanding the determinants of genomic diversity, population structure, and fitness across species. But his group placed substantial emphasis on provision of data and recommendations to management authorities. So it's very into action and policy development. He's a professor of biodiversity and in on environmental sustainability. He's director of biobanking charity at the Frozen Arc and is a co-chair of the IUCN Conservation Genetics Specialist Group. Uh, the floor is yours, Mike. Thank you very much, Margarita. Good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me okay? I'll take that as a as a yes. Oh, sorry, there's some something in the chat. Just I just want to make sure that the, everything's working okay. Okay, oh, thank you. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is give you a brief discussion, really to kick off the um, the Just way sorting out some audio problems. See everything now. Yes, it's fine. Okay, so what I'm going to do is to sort of start the whole process. Is instead of actually giving you a state of the art, give you an idea of why, we, how, and why we got where we are now, and um, just one or two short examples of why genomics is being applied in conservation and fairly simple examples as well, just to give you an idea of, um, of the, the transition that we're going through. Often when I speak to um, conservation practitioners, their first you know, comment is, why are we doing genomics? We've only just started doing molecular genetics. And so I think what I'm gonna try and do is take you through a little bit of the history to where we've got to right now, talk a little bit about the imp implementation of genomics, and then talk a little bit about the, um, the Congress project where we first started having discussions with policymakers um, and then leading into the current policy situation, which I think Pear and uh, Linda are gonna be discussing. Genetic diversity in general, um, although everybody knows that it's a very important component of biodiversity, genetic diversity has always had a, a bit of an image problem within the conservation community and within the community at large, I would say. It's hidden largely, you don't see it, um, and people associate genetic management with lots of other issues that have got nothing to do with genetic management as many of us would appreciate it, whether, it, whether they um, confuse it with genetic manipulation or right at this current moment in time, very, very, very um, clearly with the de-extinction discussion, um, genetics really is quite controversial and remains so. And yet we all know that managing genetic diversity is very important. So this is something that we've had to deal with really over the last 20 or 30 years while trying to get this important third component of biodiversity into the policy landscape. 
Although um, it's been a long road, genetics has been acknowledged as being important right from the outset. So for example, if we go back to the early 1980s, um, Frankel and Soule's book, Conservation and Evolution, um, really uh, was a, a very uh, sort of early um, milestone in describing the importance of genetic diversity and the viability of populations. And then the following decade, when DNA-based studies took over, culminating in the establishment of the journal Molecular Ecology in 1992, which came out in the same year as the CBD. Um, and, um, you know, it, genetics started to be very clearly implicated in conservation. And really over the following decade, between the establishment of the journal and then the establishment of the more um, niche journal, Conservation Genetics, you know, the, the, the number of studies that started using genetics in conservation really mushroomed, really um, um, became, you know, growing rapidly. Um, but the, despite all of this, the uptake of genetic data in policy and management remained very poor. And in fact, there was a paper published by Linda and colleagues in 2010, which described the neglect of genetic diversity in the implementation of the CBD, which complained and very reasonably so about this. And it's only really in the last decade that genetics has um, had any real um, visibility in the policy landscape at all. And um, one, and, and, and there's, there are a number of reasons for that. I'll come back to that in a second. But one of the outcomes of that was the establishment of the IUCN Conservation Genetic Specialist Group in 2014. Um, now, genetic tools have changed over the years. They started out with the most simple, visible, heritable indicators. These three snow geese represent um, three individuals that have different plumage colors, which is controlled by a simple single genetic locus, a white snow goose mum, a blue snow goose dad, and a blue and white snow goose offspring. But these single gene indicators of genetic inheritance are very rare indeed. Uh, most species don't have them. And as a result of that, people started studying, first of all, variable proteins called allozymes in the 1960s, and then into the 1970s, started st studying DNA molecules. And that DNA, those DNA molecules could be within the chromosomes or they could be within the mitochondria where there is a small circular piece of DNA which is inherited maternally, which evolves rapidly that can be used to study genetic diversity as well. Uh, and more recently now, as you know, people are starting to study the whole genome. And so these genetic tools have gradually accumulated over time. And nowadays, most people look at thousands or even millions of these, what we call single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs, which are changes at a single known site at a, in a single genome. And by combining many, many thousands or hundreds of thousands or indeed millions of these, we can get high resolution um, picture of the genetic diversity and its adaptive value in, uh, in endangered species. And what, one of the reasons we can do that is because we can use these, um, these, these large data sets now, and we can combine them with simulations of genealogies in populations. So we may be able to sequence the genome of Charles II of Spain, but we can use Charles II of Spain's genome to infer what kind of pedigree he had, including obviously all of the well-known um, uh, inbreeding that's, that went on in the royal houses of Europe. But the point is that by taking the genetic data now, we can infer the demography of the population that happened in the past by the distribution of genetic variants within the genome. 
So the combination of whole genome data and the variation with that genome, with being able to take the data to um, simulate and reconstruct the demographic history of the individual that provided that information allows us now to use gen uh, uh, genomics to get a fine level of detail about the genetic diversity in the population. And it also allows us to measure one of the key components of loss of genetic diversity is affecting populations worldwide, which is known as genetic erosion. Genetic erosion was, um, has been described for a long time, but was actually explicitly raised in the Aichi Target 13 um, that came out of Nagoya in 2010. And basically it's usually interpreted as loss of genetic variation. And that could be due to founder effect, just a few founding individuals. It could be due to genetic drift, which is small population size and unequal mating between families. It could be, be due to inbreeding, mating among relatives. But genetic erosion doesn't only have to imply loss of genetic diversity. It could be the gain of the wrong type of genetic variation. So that could be due to accidental or even deliberate hybridization, or it could be due to introgression, which is genetic dilution um, between um, very, very similar species. Now to accurately do, um, to measure these, all of these things, founder effect, drift, inbreeding, um, introgression and hybridization, you need genomics. And that's why genomics has become so important over the last um, decade or so. We know that in anthropogenically disturbed populations, the genetic diversity is lower than it is in populations which are undisturbed. So we need to study what's causing that um, loss of genetic diversity and um, its, um, its consequences. Why is it important? Well, the reason it's important from a policy perspective is that a picture is now emerging that populations that have higher genetic diversity have greater resilience to, to shocks and to anthropogenic habitat change. One of the key ecosystems where this has been discovered is in seagrasses. Um, here are a few papers on seagrasses which show that um, ecosystem after a climate extreme is enhanced by genotypic diversity and that genetic diversity enhances resistance of seagrass ecosystems to disturbance. And a couple of weeks ago, there was a very interesting paper, again on seagrass genetic genomic diversity um, and how different populations with different genotypes respond uh, in an advantageous way. So we know that genetic diversity is important because it gives populations resilience um, and, um, and especially becoming more important under a climate change scenario. Now, how do we bring these things together? Well, the um, IUCN Conservation Planning Specialist Group has developed something called the One Planning Approach to Conservation. Many of you will be aware of it, where essentially we begin to acknowledge that the differences between in situ and ex situ conservation are becoming increasingly artificial and that populations, um, species and genes need to be um, um, uh, 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 manipulated and moved around systems so that we maintain as much genetic diversity as possible. That can be simply com combining captive breeding and uh, wild population management, but can involve more um, technologically advanced approaches, including gene banks, um, cryopreservation over long periods of time, um, and um, other forms of ar artificial reproductive technology. Um, when it comes to looking at populations in, in the present day, the one thing that, that I think is really important to say is that with genomics now, we have a full arsenal of uh, material to help us work. We usually have access to museum samples that will give us a window on the 
past population status. What was the population structure of the species concerned before anthropogenic change modified it? We can get a very good idea of what happening in, is happening in the present by using genomic data. Um, and then even better, we can take the results from the present day data and predict into the future and ask the question, what do we expect to the population um, given this level of genetic diversity in its um, pristine state, given the level of genetic diversity in the present day and given what will happen into the future. Um, and by combining this past, present, future approach, this is how we potentially manage populations with um, the future in mind. Now, sequencing of genomes is becoming very, very widespread um, the, in, in, right across the, the globe with global and local whole genome sequencing initiatives happening. Um, in the UK at the moment, we have something called the Darwin Tree of Life Project, which is going to be sequencing 66,000 UK species. There are similar plans across the globe. Um, and these projects like the Earth Biogenome Project, they talk about these being moonshot projects, really uh, um, projects which are aimed at um, re, you know, recovering huge amounts of data for the good of humanity. But really, um, you know, the question is, why would we want to do that um, for all species? Now, if you look at the Earth Biogenome Project, they basically say to conserve, protect, and restore biodiversity. So what do they actually mean by, by that? Well, a few years ago, a number of us sat down and looked at what genomics could potentially bring to um, uh, this, this kind of discussion. And we realized that in a few cases, it could be transformative, certainly transformative in terms of inferring the past, definitely transformative in finding genes that tell us about adaptation, um, and um, even more importantly, inbreeding depression as well. But actually, it, it, they can be used in many, many different uh, situations. So to get greater understanding of what's happening in populations of endangered species, genomics can take us from a, uh, uh, from a, a more sort of quality assessment of genetic diversity to a fine scale quantitative assessment and allow us to pinpoint the genes that potentially uh, underpin fitness in these populations. Um, and this idea has been taken and, and thought about in, in some detail. Here's a beautiful example, um, or a theoretical example, which basically says if you take all of the single nucleotide polymorphisms in a population, in a series of populations, populations of the white dots. And it tells you that there are two big groups of, of populations that group together genetically. That's using their whole genome data. This tells you about their evolutionary um, history at the very um, ancient scale. So these are what we would call different evolutionary significant units. Then if we just use this, the S within the market within the market data set that are responding to demographic history we'll find out more groups more groups of populations and these are ones that are bounded in yellow that are exchanging genes so whereas before we had this large number of white dots um, now we've broken them down into two major groups and then into six major groups in one and five major groups in another and then if we take the um, data from the genomes of these animals that are responding to selection, we can put more bounds on. So within these different red boxes, these are populations that share the same adaptive genetic signatures. So whereas before we had all of these white, white blobs in, uh, and, and um, that we would have to conserve, we broke them down into two for their evolution. We've broken them down into 11 to take into account their gene flow 
And here we've broken them down back into four to take into account their local adaptation. And if you were to have very limited money, you could go from all of these different white dot blocks to choose a few examples of each of these four groups in red that will give you populations that are adaptively um, differentiated from each other, but which are capable of sharing genes. So it's a way of being able to use genomic data to actually pass your um, data set and um, help you choose populations for management. It's also um, by looking at these, these markers that give you the red differences between these populations that are adaptively different, you can use those to find genetic markers that discriminate populations, whereas others, others do not. So this is an example of some work from a few years ago where people looked at European fish species that normally show no genetic differentiation between fish populations at all. But by looking for those genes that show local adaptation, for example, to water temperature, um, we, they were able to pinpoint uh, a few SNPs, a few genes that accurately differentiated the different fish populations. And so they took a subset of the total number of SNPs, focused on those which are showing local adaptation and used those to devise, devise a set of tools to be able to distinguish different fish populations of these species, um, giving um, a kind of forensic uh, uh, approach to population management. Now, if we look at the way in which conservation genetics and genomics has been developing over time. It's only really since the beginning of HE Target 13 that policy has come into the discussion at all. It's virtually always been pure science, and sometimes, if you're lucky, a little bit of management. Policy has begun to come into the discussion. It's blossomed in the last few years because of the efforts of a few people, um, but it really needs to be, to, to, to be more emphasised. A beginning approach to that was something that we ran as a precursor to G-Bike, which is the Congress project, where we've started the discussion between the scientific community and with the practitioner community. Um, we formed this website. We produced knowledge packs, a publications database, a community forum, and then some planning tools, which the, the community could use. Um, and it's, you know, a lot of these tools are still useful now. Um, and we started this debate about bridging the divide between conservation research and practice. We went out on a lot of um, uh, meetings across Europe to do this kind of discussion, um, including one which was held um, in, in Spain. Um, and we produced a lot of different uh, um tools, including PowerPoint presentations and also leaflets um, in many in different European languages. So that was useful. But this is all pre-genomics. And then in 2014, we established the IUCN Genetic Specialist Group. And now we have 108 members who are now found all over the world um, working on, on these problems. We have a number of different um, issues that we're working on at the moment, um, particularly um, strong groups in Africa, North America, um, and in Oceania, I would say, working on lots of different um, conservation genetics programs. We don't have enough policymakers within our group. So if there are any of you interested um, in joining our group who are, have a policy focus, that would be brilliant if you would be interested to become involved. Um, and we've been contributing to lots of debates, the Nagoya Protocol uh, on access and benefit sharing and digital sequence information being just the most recent. And so now we are in the era of genomics, and that's really the issue of the, the, the G-Bike pro program and project, which is to upscale up really the um, knowledge within the practitioner community on what genomics can provide to 
conservation programs that genetics could not. Um, and that's where I, I guess uh, we'll, we, we start. The one thing that's been really important become very clear is that collaboration between groups is really important. And so we've been working within the IUCN genetic specialist group, with GBike, with the Society of Conservation Biology, and with the Group on Earth uh, um, Observations uh, Biodiversity Observation Network as well, to actually make sure this happens properly. So that's, um, that's as far as I want to take it to set everybody else up. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mike. I think we'll move on to the next presentations and then we'll have a few questions. Yes, if that's okay. So <clears throat> the next present presenter, the next two presenters are also G-bikers. Um, Professor Linda Leik is a professor at the Stockholm University. She has a particular research interest in understanding evolutionary processes that govern rates of loss of genetic diversity, how those processes are affected by human activities, and what can be done to assure long-term survival and adaptive potential of populations. Professor Like uses a variety of species to address conservation genetic issues. Um, she has a number of important um, publications on effective population size. She will talk a bit about that. We will discuss that a bit. She's been leading CBD webinars within the G-Bike and uh, giving the opportunity of interactions between the CBD focal points, national focal points, and um, to have the opportunity to discuss a common position during CBD. Linda, hello, good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much. Good Sorry for ugly nose. I, I stumbled the other day and fell on my face. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's I'm very glad to be here and I'm here to get Per So I will start off and then Per will will speak a little bit more and give some examples. Okay, I'll briefly introduce Per as well. Per Jugen Gulf is a professor at the Uppsala University, is a senior scientific advisor. He's been having a lot of uh, practice experience at the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency. He's a specialist in population analysis, and among his work has been metapopulation modeling of the pool frog. And he has a lot of experience with the Article 17 analysis of favorable conservation status of four large carnivore species. And he will talk a bit about that today as well. Okay, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. So we will talk about effective population size, as Margarita mentioned. And as we have heard from, from the introductions here and from Mike's talk, diversity is extremely important. And generally, we, we find from decades of em empirical studies that when populations have high genetic diversity, here symbolized with colors, this is often associated with high adaptive capacity good potential for long-term survival and high resilience. Whereas low genetic diversity here symbolized with few colors, typically associated with low adaptive capacity and weak potential for long-term survival and low resilience. And there are many examples of these connections, these general connections. And one example concerns corals where it has been shown in a rather recent study that Corals can adapt better to warmer ocean temperatures when they have a lot of standing genetic variation. And similarly, a case of the opposite, we have the Isle Royale wolves, which are highly inbred. And this is associated to rapid population decline, inbreeding depression expressed as spinal disorders and so on. And there are many other examples. And Margarita has mentioned the G-bike policy briefs where you can find more such examples. So with this general knowledge about the importance of genetic diversity, key questions then 
becomes that we need to understand how fast particular populations that we are responsible for, that we are managing, how fast does it lose genetic variation? And is the population I'm managing, is it large enough to maintain sufficient levels of genetic diversity? And here the concept of effective population size, often abbreviated with ME, can help us. So I think it's easy to think about effective population size as the symbol of an olive, where the green area represents the census size, the actual number of individuals in the populations, while the red represents how the population behaves genetically, the effective population size, ME. Because typically the effective population size is much smaller than what the census size indicate. So the census size does not tell us exactly how, how, how the population behaves genetically, while at the same time it's this ME, the red area of the olive, that determines the, the rate at which we lose variation and the capacity we have for maintaining it over time. And there are several factors then that affects effective population size, several demographic factors. And just looking at a very simple example, we can look at sex ratio, which is one of these demographic factors that affects ME. So if we have two examples here with a population which has a census size of 100, but a very skewed sex ratio, only one male and 99 females. And in the other example, we have completely equal sex ratio, but a small population, two males and two females. Then we can use this equation to calculate ME, looking at only sex ratio. And then we do, we multiply four with the number of males by the number of females, and then we divide this product with the census size, number of males plus number of females. And if we do this, you use the numbers that we have here for the first example, put them into the equation, one male, 99 female, females, we end up with an effective size of approximately four. So this population behaves genetically as if it was only four populations, while in the census size is actually 100. And if we do the same exercise for the small population, put in number of males and females here, we end up with, with an NE of four in this example as well. So these two populations behave genetically the same way, even though the census sizes are different. And now there are many other factors that also affect ME, and one of them is production of offsprings. So if we have a bunch of mature individuals here, again symbolizing genetic variation with color, so this one is heterozygous, has two different alleles. These can all contribute to the next generation, but let's assume that only two of them mate and have offspring. This, these are their offspring. Then this means that we, we lose genetic variation from the ones who do not reproduce. So that's an easy way to, to, to see that offspring production and variation in offspring production is highly important for how the populations behave genetically and will affect the effective population size. If few adults reproduce and contribute offspring, that means we will lose genetic diversity faster and our effective size is smaller. And in science, there is a well-established rule of thumb, which says that NE should be 100 or larger in order to maintain sufficient levels of genetic variation for adaptation. So that's a typical guideline that has reached broad acceptance over the years. And we have used this guideline to propose indicators for the CBD context. And in general, this is a good guideline to use in conservation generally. And right now in the CBD context, this effective population size about 500 is discussed to become a headline indicator in the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. We don't know yet if this would be the case, but right now that's the suggestion in ongoing um, discussions in, in the, within the CBD. 
So then it becomes important to, to know how to assess effective size. And you can do that from detailed demographic data using equations similar to what we just looked like, but more complicated ones. You can use computer simulations also based on demographic data and, and uh, get from the computer simulations, get estimates of NE. And you can use molecular genotypic data to assess it. And this has come for many populations, but in many cases, we do not have such estimates also. That's also, of course, the most common situation. And then one idea is to use census size as a proxy in the absence of direct estimates of effective size. And here we have proposed, uh, together with the, the Coalition for Conservation Genetics that Mike mentioned that NE to NC, a ratio of 0.1 is a good general proxy that we can use in the absence of genetic data. And th this is based on observed mean and median values from several numbers of scientific reviews. And that means that in the absence of any information on NE, we can use uh, this relationship. NE is 10% out of NC, which leads us to have a guiding rule of 5,000 NC in order to reach the, the NE target of 500. Also, we can use other information that is available. So we propose that when we are trying to apply this concept of having an NE that's larger than 500 in order to reach a favorable conservation situation for a population, we start off with looking at what information is available. In some cases, we will have genetic and demographic estimates, and then we can use these to see if we have an NE that's above 500. In other situations, we will have no information and then we propose to use this general um, proxy, NE to NC is 0.1, and use a census size of 5,000 as, as a principle for reaching NE500. And in other situations, we might have information from similar taxonomic groups, similar species on this ratio, effective size to census size. And then we can use that, that um, uh, ratio to find out what census size we need to reach 500. And such estimates have been presented for several carnivore populations. This is from a review by Sean Hoban et al in biological conservation. And here we see that for many carnivore populations that have been studied in this re respect, we have, we have some that are at 0.1, but we have others that are a little bit higher than 0.1. So one option is to use these kind of already available data from other populations in our management. And this is what both Per and I will be doing in, in some practical examples, because I've been involved in, together with many other researchers, in the situation of the wolves in Scandinavia. In Scandinavia, we have a population that has been closely monitored for a long time, for several decades. And it has a very narrow genetic base. In practice, only five founders, and three of them have the lo very large contribution to the population. Inbreeding is very high, still around 0.25, which is what you get when you mate uh, full sieve offspring with each other. So extremely high inbreeding. And long-term genetic isolation, very limited gene flow over the years into this population. So a very serious uh, populations from a genetic standpoint. And genomic, recent genomic work has also shown genome-wide consequences of this inbreeding, that we really do see that they are highly homozygous high, over large parts of their genome. They have lost a lot of genetic variation, this population. And the question is, how can we solve this kind of management situation? And um, one thing is, of course, we need to reduce, we need to assure that immig immigration becomes higher to reduce inbreeding. And we also need, if you want to look at this concept of NE500, we see that the current census size is around 400 now. So the population has at very high inbreeding levels currently exist here in Norway and Sweden. And using the ratio that we have observed from, from Mike's studies and another study that 
N, e, N e to NC is typically 0.25. We know that our effective population size in this population is around 100. So N is too low to reach this um, goal of N 500. And, and thus the population, in combination with its high inbreeding, it's not viable, it's not long-term viable and favorable conservation status for this population has not been reached. So in this kind of situation, what can we do? Well, we can try to see if we can create a meta population over a larger, con consider wolf population in, in close areas. If together, other populations in the nearby areas, if it's possible to create an effective population size for a meta population that's above 500. So here, for instance, a few wolves in Finland around these numbers, 220 to 245. We have these parts of the Fennoscandian Peninsula that belongs to, to Russia, it's Karelia, with around 300 wolves and approximately 100 here in the Kola Peninsula. So the question is, are these census sizes large enough? And is the gene flow among these subpopulations large enough for us to reach a meta population effective size that's about 500? And we wanted to answer these questions. And in order to do so, we needed to develop some theoretical work because classical effective population size theory is based on isolated populations. So together with mathematicians Ola Hörscher and Fredrik Olsson and Nils Reimann, we developed theory to be able to model complex metapopulations with different subpopulation sizes over time. And we realized that we need to take both local and global effective population size to be considered for conservation purposes. We performed, and we, we did a computer plan that was based on some, using some of this theory that was developed. And with that, we could model the Fennoscandian wolf population. So looking here, translating this situation here into a meta population model, we have Scandinavia here with an effective size NE of 100. We have Finland here with an effective size of 50. And that's from Joni Aspis and Eva Jonsons and, uh, and collaborators' assessments. They have been assessing effective size using molecular data in Finland as well as in Karelia, where we also have an NE of 50. And for Kola, we assumed the 25% relationship of NE to NC. The population estimate is around 100 for the Kola Peninsula. And then we, we assumed migration between these subpopulations, but we only assumed migration from Finland to Scandinavia because that's what we have been ob observing in molecular genetic monitoring data from these populations. And typically the gene flow has been unidirectional so typically wolves have migrated into Scandinavia, very rarely, but that's what's been happening. Well, while migration from Scandinavia to Finland has not been recorded, at least not when we performed this study. So we looked at the effects of unidirectional gene flow and two-way gene flow. And what we found out, we'll not go into the details here, and this is quite busy graph, but we have generation here, we have effective population size here. And the important things are the equilibrium values that we expect for the meta population here. So with one way migration, only wolves migrating from Finland to Scandinavia, and we assume a migration rate of one individual per generation which is a lot higher than what has been observed in, in real life, then we can only reach a meta population size of 130. So far from, five, from 500. And if we assume two-way migration, then we can reach a meta population NE of 250. So very important that we have two-way migration among our subpopulations. And that was an important finding of this study, um, that two-way migration is essential and that the, with current population sizes and migration rate, we cannot reach a meta population effective size that, that, is, that reach our target. 
So one more thing that we considered was, okay, but what about Russia here? We have wolf populations here in Russia. Can those populations support the Fennoscandian one? And that's turned out to be quite difficult. Even if we assume a large NE of 750 here, again, based on census size of approximately 3,000 and assuming um, the, the general ratio of 25%, we still didn't, we still had problems for the Fennoscandian population. It turned out that even if we have high migration from Russia, let's assume we get 10 migrants per generation migrating in to the Fennoscandian population here every generation. We still need migration rates among these populations here in Fennoscandia of three to five individuals per generation. And it took, will take quite some time to reach NE 500. So, and this was also new information, at least to us, that the real importance of having migration among populations, we cannot be saved even by a large population if we don't look to the, the situation within Scandinavia. So the conclusions from this study was that the current Fennoscandian wolf population can reach long term effective size of 500, we need gene flow and we need above the one migrant per generation rule. So more than one migrant per generation is needed. Two-way migration between all populations is essential. Unidirectional gene flow will decrease metapopulation effective size. And to reach conservation targets, we also need to increase the population sizes. So they are now too small, the, the local population sizes within Fennoscandia. Gene flow from a presumed large Russian population still require a lot of gene flow within Fennoscandia. And with that, I thank you for your attention. And I leave the floor to Per. Thank you very much, Linda. Can you hear me all? Yes, yes, yes. Is the first page visible now? Okay, I don't hear you, so I, I start anyway. Uh, it's on the so there, go ahead. Yeah, do you see it? The second page here in Sweden and Fennoscandia? Yeah. Okay, fine. So this is uh, about uh, the wolverine, another uh, large carnivore species in, in Northern Europe. Uh, and it's the kind of uh, transboundary population, if you like, and, and the, the situation in Sweden, Norway, and Finland. Uh, and Finland, and and Sweden are member states of the European Union. So for instance, the Natura 2000 is a kind of common uh, framework of conservation. Uh, all these three countries have ratified the Bern Convention and the Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, in this uh, monitoring uh, activities, of course, also the IUCN red list and EU species status assessments help quite a lot. There are national species information centers and for the simulations I will show uh, some of the data come from RUVBAS uh, which is common for Sweden and Norway and then also from Finland, from Luca and large carnivores in Finland. Genetic monitoring so far, uh, in general, by, uh, over species is unusual, but actually among the large carnivore, it's being used much more. So for the favorable conservation status assessment for the wolverine, the basic criterion for the total transboundary population is as Linda mentioned, uh, effective size larger than 500. 
But what at the subpopulation? Well, the first preliminary assessment is to have a look if there is less than 5% loss of genetic variation per 100 years if you are simulating uh, the Wolverine population in Sweden. And another thing to also uh, take into account is the number of reproducing immigrants from Finland and also to some extent from Norway. But Norway is really a population which is in common. So uh, Norway and Sweden share the population. And one thing which is highlighted by the guide, guidelines for, for favorable conservation status is that favorable reference population, that is the minimum size of the population is definitely larger than the subpopulation minimum viable population. So if we are looking at this uh, conservative rule on the ratio between effective size and the census size in the Wolverine, then the census size expected uh, is uh, 5,000 to be uh, equal to 500 as effective size. But, uh, Genetic studies, genetic studies, and also simulation studies have shown that this ratio is actually higher. So from uh, linkage disequilibrium studies uh, of wolverines in Finland, it was seen that it's in the order of 0.25. So the census size expected to be equal to the effective size 500 uh, for this transboundary population would be slightly above 2,000 individuals. What was the size, the census size of this transboundary metapopulation in the year 2019? Well, the total was 1,398. So it's smaller than uh, what would correspond to effective size 500. But all these national populations remain, and they are in fact also increasing. So management plans exist, and there is increased genetic monitoring and also increased co-management between countries. Now I want to show you about the validation if uh, we are thinking of the 600 Wolverines as a minimum uh, reference value for, for Sweden, uh, it can be tested using individual uh, based simulations. But first it's also needed to really uh, analyze the gene flow between the countries. And this was done in a report by Cleven et al, published in 2019. And it's based on uh, SNP markers and also microsatellites. And if Robert Ekblom is with you, he's been participating in this study too. And this show that Sweden, Norway, and Finland have subpopulations of this national transboundary large carnivore population. Uh, and the genetic connectivity analysis is confirmed and qualified, quantified uh, the gene flow also. Uh, from the demographic analysis that were done in 2013 by Nelson, it was known that the, uh, the population growth rate on average is around 5% increase per year. And from that, the minimum viable population of the Swedish subpopulation was estimated at 500 individuals census size. But then the, the reference population value should be higher than this minimum viable population. So it was actually politically set as 600. Uh, but is this 600 enough? Well, 
we use the validation using the individual based vortex model. And that is a bit of a similar, but also a different approach. It's an individual based model. So you can have the population have a certain degree of genetic variation, and then you see what happens with that genetic variation during the course of the simulations. And the simulations were done quite long time. It correspond to a hundred generations. And that is because long-term is really important to discern long-term effects. And in these simulations, the gene flow quantified according to Cleven et al was used. And there was assumed that there is no immigration from Russia. And here you can see the dispersal matrix and it's calculated uh, so it's per year, each year. And then you should remember also that the generation time, the time for one generation to pass of the Wolverine is uh, above seven years. So if you multiply these percentages with seven or, or eight years, then you get uh, the proportion of individuals that become immigrants into the receiving population per generation. And from this, you can see that actually from Finland to Sweden, it's by way over Norway. So uh, the Swe Sweden does not receive very many immigrants from Finland directly, but by way over Norway, they come into Sweden and vice versa that there is a lot of gene flow from Sweden to Norway, for instance. And here is just one replicate to show over all these years, what are the population sizes. And so it's the meta population in Lyle uh, at the top. And then you can see the blue is Sweden and then Norway is red and you have the Finnish uh, subpopulation, which is in green. Now you can see that the number of wolverines in Norway is very, very stable. And you can see that Sweden is fluctuating a little bit more. And interestingly, uh, it's Finland that seems to be not doing so well uh, when you have it for a very, very long time. And if you are repeating this, so this is a subset of a uh, hundred replicates from actually a thousand replicates that were run of the simulations, you can see that it's the Finnish population that tends to decrease over time, probably because it's uh, a bit too small and uh, it's losing genetic diversity and inbreeding becomes a problem if there is not any immigration from Russia. And by keeping track of the remaining uh, genetic variation, heterozygosity, from the start of the simulation until the end of, of the replicates, uh, one can see, so the, the simulations were performed with the number of Wolverine known from each country in 2018, and then it was simulated for 657 years. And you can see the size of the populations there in the third column, so uh, Finland was decreasing, but otherwise uh, it was that Sweden and Norway were slightly increasing on average over this large time period. And if you look at the proportion of remaining genetic diversity in the simulations, you can see that that corresponded to a mean effective population size of slightly above 550 for Sweden uh, and this was with this, uh, that the population was larger than the 600. And uh, for Norway, it was a bit lower, 510. And Finland is actually the subpopulation around, if it's not larger than 350, it will not maintain genetic vari variation very well and also seems to be doing uh, very poorly demographically if there's no immigration from Russia. So overall, the situation here uh, uh, in total was not enough to have 
correspond to the effective size larger than 500. So the conclusions and suggestions from this simulation is that, well, it's noted that by combination of subpopulation size and gene flow, the subpopulations may retain genetic variation to a, a, an extent that the scientific criterion for long-term genetic uh, viability might be met actually. But continuous natural gene flow is required for population viability and this scenario to be fulfilled. And so it must be, must be scientifically verified, of course. The above requires multilateral cooperation in the large carnivore management regarding gene flow and also subpopulation sizes. And at this time, it seems that uh, Norway, we are discussing with them. Uh, Sweden is discussing with them. And uh, Finland also are considering this perspective. And so larger Wolverine populations in these two countries are strongly recommended. Gracias, obrigado. Okay. Um, Let's see if I can. Um... Thank you, Pear and Linda. I I think we have time to take two questions. Uh, could you just get rid of my screen sharing so that you can um, get a normal? Hang on. Stop share. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I, I just get, there's a, a question from Rebecca Boulan. I think, could you please explain the effective population size and census size to be sure I got it right? Linda, would you like to? Yes, okay, so the census size, it's the number of individuals in the populations, in the population, the number of individuals you have. And the effective size is the size is the genetic size of the population. So because the because you have demographic effects like unequal sex ratio, not all individuals contribute equally, etc. The genetic size of the population may be much smaller than the census size, and typically it's around ten percent of the of the census size. I hope that makes it clearer. If not, please ask again. Okay. Um, Joaquin's reminding me that you will give a presentation that talks a bit more about effective population size. So I think that's all right. <clears throat> there was also a question about using creo preserved gametes instead of moving individuals. Yeah, it, it has been discussed for the wolves, but it has not been carried out. It's, it's been discussed, for instance, if we could do cross-fostering using uh, individuals in, the, in zoos. So exchanging pups, for instance, that has been done in North America for, for similar species. But it has not been carried out in Sweden, and I think it's, it's very difficult and, of course, also dangerous for, for the animals to do this kind of manipulation. So, but that, that could aid. I mean, we have done studies showing that using those, those kind of techniques, we can reduce inbreeding, we can increase the effective size, but it's complicated and, and it's um, expensive. And it, there are no practical plans for doing it at this point. Okay. Also, also, it seemed from discussions uh, in an expert group on uh, favorable conservation values uh, that the, the aim uh, referring to the directive, for instance, the, the habitats and, and the directive, is that uh, the kind of priority is really to have it functioning naturally. So, so. Uh, it's being questioned uh, whether this kind of 
management, if you call it that, by artificial insemination, for instance, that it, uh, it would be uh, only in the most uh, grave cases uh, where there is no other alternative, no other option, that it might be acceptable, but otherwise uh, uh, it's really uh, strongly recommended and advocated that uh, the natural gene flow is the best. Okay. Anybody in the room would like to put a question? I have a question. Uh, the difference between, I don't know if it's comparable, but between wolves and, and wolverines, because I understood the gene flow is different. As um, Finland, there's migration from Finland to the other countries uh, with wolves, but with the wolverines is, is a different scenario. It, do you have any explanation? Is this common or this is like the genetic data you have that, um, made you suppose that migration difference? <clears throat> I speculate uh, that respect me if, I, if I'm not uh, correct. Uh, the wolverine has, uh, it doesn't reproduce as good uh, as wolves and that depends on that it, it, it's a scavenger and so Sometimes food is really uh, not 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 so uh, how do you say uh, so, so uh, anyway it has a lower population growth rate than the wolf has and for that matter um, it it will be a bit different uh, with respect to social structure also the wolves are, are uh, I mean they are like these packs while the, the wolverines are, are uh, singular females with their, with their offspring, but the, the, the males, they, they are kind of dispersing and roaming the countries. Uh, so th it's uh, very much them that uh, are, are doing the gene flow between uh, regions within the country and also between countries possibly. So, yes, yeah, so there, there is uh, presently discussions with Finland in particular to, to also uh, safeguard and increase uh, the gene flow of wolverines between the countries in, in uh, Fennoscandia. Okay, Paulo has a question. Uh, Maybe you come here, or you just say it and I repeat it. Ah, Michael, hang on. So, so hello everybody. Thank you, uh, Linda and Pierce, for, for the fantastic talk. Um, my question is regarding the, the Henny and the 500. Uh, I think you, you it's important to have as high as possible the, the Henny. And uh, there is this um, uh, roll of thumb roll uh, uh, of the, the 500. But uh, uh, in fact, uh, we, we see that uh, in several cases that the, there are less, the Henny is, is much lower than, than, than 500. And, uh, and I, I am here in Toledo in this room and I am seeing a lot of friends that are working in Iberian Links project. I also have colleagues that are working here and I know what they are doing on the, on the Iberian Wolf. And I, I believe for both pieces, at least for sure for the Iberian Links that the Henny is much lower than 500. Does it mean that what they are doing in all these life projects is for nothing? Uh, uh, or or uh, because uh, 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 seeing what you are what you are doing in Scandinavia for recovering the wolf, which is fantastic, and 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 and, and getting a meta population and and doing all efforts for for doing this for for conservation is really great, but but there are situations that this is uh, this is impossible. So and. 
And I think the people here would like to, to, to hear your advice and your thoughts on, on, on this. Thank you. Linda, please, you first. Well, I think it's, it's not, as long as you have individuals living, the, the situation is you still have hope. So I think you should never give up trying to conserve a population, even if you have few number of, of individuals and if you cannot reach any 500, I think you should still do your best. And there is still possibilities to conserve the populations over time. But of course, you must also realize that it is not the best genetic situation and you should argue for and try to increase the population size as much as is possible. That, that would be my advice, but not giving up and still it's very important the conservation measures that you are taking to conserve a population and hopefully it also depends on a case by case basis what will happen when you have inbreeding in a population when you have a too small effective population size that varies depending on the genes in, in the populations as well. Per, would you like to add, add something? Yes, I, I would go along the same, but also emphasize uh, the importance also of this uh, connectivity. And if it's not really possible, uh, then it might be a good, a good idea to translocate individuals between the remaining uh, populations and also maybe consider to uh, reintroduce the species at some places uh, where, where it's uh, where it's possible, uh, but I think that the the effect actually of gene flow and translocations, if they are successful and and uh, translocated individuals reproduce in the recipient population, it has a very very strong genetic effect and uh, it's usually positive also. So uh, with this large carnivores, it seems like, like uh, the, the gene flow, either uh, the best is natural, of course, but the, uh, if it's uh, assisted and successful, that it has a very large and positive genetic effect on, on the populations. Okay, I think we're gonna have a break now. Thank you everybody that has been online with us we're very happy we've been having 88 participants please stay with us we're gonna make a break now and we'll be back at 12 okay at 12 o'clock maybe yeah, we'll and thank you very very much it's been great to to uh, meet up with you thank you very much please come back and i'm sure we'll have some time to discuss some of these questions okay thank you
of the ME. And that's because each method has different assumptions. And so you could get ME estimates from the same sample spanning orders of magnitude. And all of this is called the effective size. Yeah. This has led to a Babylonian speech confusion. This is literally what they said, but in Whitney's font. <laughs> so, and this Babylonian speech confusion is very harmful for conservation itself because it, it, people don't understand anymore what, what we are saying as population geneticists. Because one time someone says it's uh, effective size, it's 10,000, and you're like, no, no, it's 50. With the same data set. And, and all of these are correct, but it depends on, on, um, on temporal and spatial aspects. But importantly, it's good to understand what are the real drivers of MP, what makes the difference between a sensitive size with the number of adult individuals in the population and the effective size. So, in this ideal theoretical right visual population, both are equal. And this means that. The average family size, so how many offspring there are, there are, is equal to the variance. So variance is a measure of spread, the statistical measure of spread. And so you can calculate the effective size from so the average family size and then the variance with this formula. And um, this formula can, I, can also be simplified when you have a stable population. So when the average family sizes to find the stable population. And then you see it simplifies to actually uh, in the, here there is your census side and below in the denominator you have this variance measure. And when the variance in reproductive reproductive success increases, N T decreases. And some species have intrinsically small ranges for this, this variance. For example, rhinoceros well, at most they have 12 offspring during their lifetime. So the, vari the variation among individuals can never be very, very large. And say, look, pandas, for example, or maybe with, with Iberian kings as well. But other species like this Atlantic cod, well, a single female can have per kilogram of body weight 250,000 eggs. And so she lives for 25 years. So Imagine the huge amount of offspring she could theoretically have, and also the very stress is involved. So, in such a species, the effective size is typically much, much smaller than the sensitive size. And the sex ratio, as explained by Linda previously, is also actually a special case of variance in reproductive success. I will skip a little bit here. But we can actually show this mathematically, and it's just the same thing, just the variance of the process. For those interested, you can look it up later on. Now, zooming out a bit, we've talked a lot of biodiversity and what is it actually. And this is even, this is something pretty abstract. So, what is it? Is it a list of species? Is it a mathematical index between 0 and 1, and if it's close to 1, it's high, and if it's close to 0, it's low. Well, it is actually, it depends on how you look at it, but we can view this as a richness, huh? which is just the sum of different types. So you have 20 species here, but then the richness is 20. But you can also account for evenness differences. So we one species is very abundant and others are very rare. So this diversity accounts for frequency differences. And you can, you can prove mathematically that they are intrinsically related. So richness can be viewed as the diversity divided by the evenness. And you can, you can also intuitively see that, suppose that these are uh, species that is purple, green, blue, and yellow. Here, you have a high evenness because you have equal abundances of each species, and here you have low evenness. So the richness here is the same for species, for both, but the diversity here will be much higher than here because here you have just only a few rare species and they contribute very little. You see the 
by a little bit effective side and sensitive side contributes very little. The Simpson index of diversity, this is something everybody knows, I think, in ecology or it's a, it's a standard index. Well, the expected figure of diversity, the gene diversity, that we calculate when we say genetic diversity, is that's the index that we use. But we can, it's also an index varying between zero and one, but we can translate this into also an effective number of alleles. And the advantage here is expressing the same unit as the original, just a number of alleles. And this makes it easy to compare. And if we then take an example, for example, the three population with frequencies of alleles, A and C, all the same frequencies, high even. Here we have the same richness, also five alleles present, but very unevenly distributed. Here we have only two alleles, but close to evenly distributed. If you then look at richness, five, five, two, and diversity, so the effective number of alleles is five, one point one, and close to two. You see, you actually need both to understand what is the genetic diversity. You need the richness and the diversity. Now we can actually view effective size in a parallel way. The population size, the census size, you can view as a richness. How many adults are present? We tell it again. And the population size diversity is then the effective size. It's how much each individual contributes to the next generation. Some have many of screen. Some have very few. For example, I, I checked for the Central European Bull population. We have a, a very detailed overview on litter size for different pairs of individuals. Some have a lifetime reproductive success of 15 plus. Some of them zero. So this variance there causes a lower effective size and sensitive size. And so these are two sides of the same coin. We need both information on sensitive size and effective size, on the richness and the diversity, in order to understand how populations behave uh, genetically. And so I told you, give the same data set to different people and you will get different testing. So it's important to have a kind of a common language here. So it's also it's already mentioned that you need a reference point in time. You also need a reference point in space. To tell you I'm talking about this subpopulation or this meta population at this point in time and in space. So for example, you have a, an area here that's green and been inhabited by some species, and you take a sample from it. 30 individuals, we genotype them. What are you measuring? Well, actually, you sample N individuals, but also two N parents, and four N grandparents, and eight N great grandparents, and so on. So you're also estimating genetic variants in a lot of answers. And depending on which method you're going to use, you're going to estimate. In some generations or in earlier generations, or some average uh, across time. So, with the same data sets, it could be that with a certain method you are estimating this effective size. But you could also be estimating the meta population effective size, or some ancestral population size, or some average over time. And we need to be very, very clear on which one you're actually estimating and, and reporting. And this is something we have failed at as a community since so far. So there are a few very, very good papers now that explain the intricacies of spatial and temporal aspects. They're mentioned here. Um, but here we're going to just take two aspects. First, to be historical and So, this is what explains the current genetic makeup. It explains why a population has some genetic diversity right now. Because in the past, it went maybe through a bottleneck and then expanded and got the gene flow from here, etc., etc. But this 
business for conservation purposes not necessarily the most interesting. Because if we want to model how the population will evolve in the future, we actually need a contemporary effective diet. It reflects the genetic risk of the least in the past, in the past generation. And it's also what we can expect in future genetic risk under a business as usual scenario. So this is most relevant for conservation and management. So this is the, the, the effective size we're going to need for, um, for simulation and for modeling. But then, which contemporary effective size are we going to use? And it's good to know if you have structured populations or mega populations with different subpopulations. Well, you can estimate also at different spatial scales. So the meta population effective size is, let's say, the old. And then there is the local effective size. This is an effective size you can estimate as if it existed in isolation without the mitigating effect of gene flow. And if you would then just sum up the existing subpopulations, the sum should be the same as the meta population size. But there are also some methods will give you the inbreeding effective size. So this is the size with the mitigating effect of gene flow from your neighboring subpopulation. And there are actually, on some assumptions, a this kind of relationship for FSP, like some genetic differentiation between populations. So, this inbreeding effect of size will come close to the total meta population size when the FSP is very low, so when there is no genetic differentiation. For example, a meta population where the sum of uh, where the sum is about thousand, consisting of ten subpopulations of one hundred, could be that this inbreeding effective size is close to nine hundred because of very low genetic differentiation. So if you look at the end of this formula, this gives you more information on what where do we have this magical number of one migrant per generation from. Because if you plot the gene flow, so how, how much genetic uh, exchange there is among subpopulations, again, how the local genetic diversity is related to the total genetic diversity around this one migrant per generation is at this tipping point. And around this tipping point, a population starts to behave as part of a large meta population or below as an isolated population. So this is why this one migrant per generation is so important in conservation. That's the, the, the tipping point. Above this, it will start to behave like a meta population. Below, it behaves as an isolated one. Now, I'm going to give you an example on, on a large carnivore on a more strong. And just to show you this, this difficulty of estimating effective size at the right fish scale. So here we have an area of about 300 hectares with 24 ponds in which the more frogs occur. And you can, you can actually go there and say, I want to estimate the effective size of the more frog better population or the more frog and take a sample of individuals. But depending on how you take this, you get a different, uh, different answer. If you take it from a single pond, well, it could be that you're just estimating this local effective size in the single pond and not at the meta population level. And so, for example, on the 24 pond here, we have effective sizes for each local one, and the average effective size is about 28. But the sum of all these 24 is close to 700. And if you combine them all together and take a random sample again, and then estimate the effective size, we have again some, some figure that's between 600 and 700. So it's, it's more than an order of magnitude difference. So depending on how you're approaching this. So it's very good to realize what you're sampling. Are you sampling this meta population randomly or are you taking a subpopulation and so on? So again, be aware which effective size you're actually measuring. Now we can implement these principles into criteria of species conservation. Uh, this I've already talked about, talked about the favorable 
reference population. And since 2012, the habitat directive also asks you to report on the genetic diversity of species uh, when you're reporting for the habitat directive. And we've seen that a lot of papers have been, have been published in the past 10 years on that we need to include genetics into policy and into management. But so far, this is still, there's still a long way to go. I could go on like this. Yeah? Uh, and the good thing about population is it gives you a very good theoretical political framework. Uh, and this is the power of population genetics. So when we take that, for example, this genetic criterion that your meta population effective size should be larger than 500, and you should have one fiber per generation from the subpopulation, well, we can translate this into give or take a few assumptions for census size of at least 5,000. And then there's this one fiber per generation. And let me give you two examples of how we can implement this. We're not capable of doing population genetics in every population, in every species. So we need to make choices and, and smart choices because genetics is going to cost a lot. We need a smart way of, of choosing where this is necessary. But we can use proxies of local effective size and meta population effective size. We can validate these proxies and then target specifically which population we're going to. Uh, sample genetically. So we've, we've heard about this one in ten ratio already, but we could also use the whole range in habitat use of an individual in optimal habitat. If we have to say a spatial extent, you know there's 200 hectares of forest, and you have density of so many individuals per hectare for this particular species, you could estimate what would be your the carrying capacity. We can define a minimum area of this NP500 patchwork. So, how much, how many hectares, how many square kilometers of optimal habitat would you at least need? And you can compare this to the available habitat, and this is a good win. You can easily see in some cases, well, we're not going to make it. In, 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 we'll never have an NP500 in this case without even touching an individual and a genotype group. And you can compare this to actual presence. You know, citizen science data, I naturally observe the and, and so on, where you can have an indication of where the species is really distributed. And this connectivity, well, that is ecological information on the personal capacity that can be represented. I'm going again to the war front, this is in, in modern Belgium, the religious population, just by looking at how much habitat size there is. So we define that according to density in the habitat, a more frog would need at least 200 and something hectares to have this NP500. This particular population I mentioned before was this one here, where we estimated, well, oh, it's probably it's orange, it's going to be close to 500, but we're not so sure. With the genetic data we now see, yeah, it's about 600. But you also see there's a lot of these populations that are in red, where we can see clearly see this is well below this 200 hectares threshold. And so, next thing we're, what we've done this year is also sampled all of these populations genetically in order to estimate the effective size and compare this to this, this quick scan. How well does this quick scan? give a, a, a view on, on the actual effective size. So we want to compare this. A similar example with crusted loops, which is, I mean, yeah, you have to look very, very closely to find one green uh, population here. So with even, without even touching genetically, we know that 99% of our populations are in a bad conservation state and are not going to live up to this NP500 rule because there is so little habitat left. Or we can transpose this to other species. Or we can define the population boundaries and etc. I talked about this already a little bit. And just to give you an, an idea of a completely different species, the red type in Europe, it has different meta populations defined here from this paper. And we can 
actually evaluate how well each population is doing on the basis of well, how many uh, the NT to NC ratio and the number of pairs that are census each year. And you can see that the British population is close to being favorable. Uh, the Iberian population very close as well. The mainland European population, France and Germany, is doing okay, and so on. So you can you can use just without genotyping, you can estimate already quite a lot uh, about it. The gray wolf gives me already some information on the Senegal Scandic population. Um, and well, this is just again a very close uh, estimate. But you can see that this N E 500 would correspond to well 500 packs. I know this does it, it's uh, the N E and C ratio is one in five. But it's difficult with wolves because, yeah, when are you in the sensor? When are you considering a wolf to be part of a factory? Is it, it, is, it is including the bucks of last year or not including? Is it only adults or this other sensor, adults and so on? So I think it's safer to talk about reproductive units of facts, number of facts. And so you can also evaluate in this way uh, the different meta populations. And also realizing that as these meta populations are continuing to expand across Europe, they will get connected to each other. And sometimes they will have more than one migrant per generation, and then you can consider them at a bigger spatial scale again. So there is definitely room to use genetic principles without genotyping an individual. That. I'm not saying you shouldn't do this, because it's fun, it's interesting, but there's, <laughs> there's a lot of possibilities to include genetic principles into conservation without uh, requiring you to genotype all, all, all this stuff. Um, there are some issues of growth uh, that's reporting for the habitat directive is typically linked to political boundaries, but there is a way around. This is work in progress, but now for some species, uh, countries are joining forces and can be fighting fast and say, well, we agree that we should have at least this many uh, wounds and or this many bears, and together we are part of, we are part of the same meta population. So, um, and I told you that this is now being evaluated for the more frogs. We're also doing this now for the gray wolf in Central Europe. Where we have detailed information on, on census size and genomic information by history trait. And we might, I just calculated this morning, with life history trait reproductive variance. And there, if you want to know the effective to census size, it's about half of the number of facts. So if you have 300 facts, like the European population, Poland and Germany is about 300 facts, the effective size there is about 100. So we know we need to scale this up or connect with other regional populations. Uh, so yeah, look out for pitfalls. So evaluate and be at an appropriate spatial and temporal scale. And translate it into your sampling and be aware of model restrictions and with this.
basically after that why it is possible to collect uh, DNA from the environment. Uh, basically, because any, any organisms will release, uh, as we do normally with uh, our skin, uh, release uh, cells. Cells contain uh, DNA, and uh, so the different, and, uh, different sources like eggs, uh, air, leaves, uh, whatever, you can find within uh, an environmental sample. And as I told you, you can even find in the an air samples because even if we don't see, we know that if you um, pump into a, a device, which is actually just made by a, a vacuum pump and a tape, if you pump the air inside of this device, you can have a lot of uh, small particles um, on the surface of this tape, and these particles are can be small parts of insect, even uh, in, in entire insects, spores, bacteria, viruses. So anyway, uh, in, you can find DNA. This is also a, a major problem for us working uh, with uh, this kind of DNA, because actually it means that also in your lab, there is a DNA that probably you would like to get rid of, okay? So basically uh, nowadays, uh, environmental DNA is used for taxonomic identification, but of course, the, the field is uh, enlarging its scope. But I guess, especially in terms of uh, having a first look at the environmental DNA field, we can remain uh, on this part, on this taxonomic identification. Uh, just uh, for sake of completeness, I would like to, to show you this, um, this slide in which you can understand that environmental DNA analysis can be accomplished by two uh, different approaches. One is called metagenomics, and the other one is metabarcoding. Uh, since metabarcoding is the most widely used, we are going to talk uh, today only about this, especially because metagenomics um, has demonstrated to be uh, powerful, but uh, still probably not so uh, enough scalable for practical application in conservation biology. So let's have a look in uh, details, but not many details, just to, to understand um, what we do in, in the lab after collecting the samples. So you can see here, we start from the, from the sample. And uh, I would like to repeat uh, for all of you, but um, I would say 70% of the successful uh, genetics uh, study is based on, the, on a good sampling on a good sampling design, on a good sample collection, and on a good sample preservation. This is extremely, extremely relevant. So it's really up to you, I mean, the people who go in the field, but in the end, uh, the success of a genetic study is based on, okay? So it's a, it's a matter of fact, sometimes uh, I see people tend to underestimate the value of a field worker. For us, uh, we work in the lab, we know that uh, certain samples uh, makes a, a, the, the huge difference if it has been collected properly or not, if it has been preserved properly or not. And on top of that, if it had been, you know, the collection of a sample design, good or bad, this is an extreme uh, difference. So what, well, the other part uh, is not trivial as well, of course, but you know it's uh, it's like uh, the original scene if you start with a with a scene you can it's it's very hard to get rid of this okay so basically uh, after extracting dna we are just looking for some particular and peculiar stretch of dna in in the genomes and uh, we we do uh, finally a quite intensive bioinformatics uh, analysis for retrieving uh, the sequences out of the environmental samples and comparing these sequences to a reference database. Now I've just presented basic concept, but uh, don't worry, we can have time for uh, looking much more in detail. So what is a barcode marker is? Uh, here I present um, in this, uh, also if you think about this, um, the composition of this uh, figure, I would like to stress the fact that it, is, uh, it looks like a barcode uh, of the products you can find on the shelves of a supermarket. And it is exactly something like that. You can see for the different species, even from uh, for species um, which are almost uh, impossible to recognize from a morphological point of view, the first two butterflies, you can see that uh, uh, this 
bars. Each of them has a different color, represents the different nucleotides of DNA. And you can easily see that for the same part of the genomes, they are different. So there's a differentiation discriminating between species. It's a, it's a kind of, uh, you, you can use, I use always uh, this analogy. Let's think about a, a book. Uh, and actually DNA is a book. Uh, one of the main advantages of this book is it is that it's written in a universal language. It's just a single alphabet. Okay, so, and it's the same all over the organism. And so you can, uh, the book, you, you have an index. There are some chapters. And in the index, these chapters are titled with the same title for many, many different species. But the content of this chapter is different according to the species you're looking at. Okay, so this is the major uh, concept of a barcode marker. So a barcode marker is a marker uh, within DNA, which, and now I speak a little bit in terms of uh, technical details, which has a flanking region the title of the chapter, common from several different phylogenetic species, and the content, which is the interior region, which is different according to the different species, okay? And to be a very good barcode marker, uh, it's very simple to understand, but you need to have the so-called barcoding gap. So this marker uh, has to express a very different, very uh, big distinction between the intraspecies variation, so the, the red part of the curve, and the interspecies uh, differentiation, okay? In that case, you can be, let's say, 100% sure, but what we, are, uh, what we are looking is really a difference between different species. Otherwise, if you finish, if you end up in the orange zone, you might be not able to understand whether your sample is coming from a certain species or a certain population of that species or from a different species. Okay, so this is the basic concept of a good barcode marker. Uh, this, is, uh, this, this is universal as a concept, and uh, uh, probably it also the reason why at some point, uh, the very beginning of the meta barcoding uh, approaches, the, the barcoding approach, to be honest. Uh, uh, some people thought but it would be possible to have a, a single universal marker for all the organisms. Now we know that it is impossible. For some organisms, for instance, in birds, it works pretty well, and we use the cytochrome oxidase 1 of the mitochondrial DNA. For other organisms like plants, for instance, you, you have to use many different barcode markers in order to have uh, the, the certainty of identifying a uh, species. Okay, so now let's have a look at the pros and the cons of the meta uh, barcoding approach. So um, the advantages are uh, the specificity of your barcode markers. You can adapt these barcode markers in terms of the, the phylogenetic scale uh, uh, are working. So for instance, it is like having subparagraph in the same uh, chapter. So of course, subparagraphs refer, for instance, to species belonging to the same family. The, uh, um, having a reference database uh, really restricts the burden of bioinformatics analysis. And on top of that, I will say, since this technique is based on an in vitro amplification of your template DNA, it means that you can use even very, very low amount of DNA. This is an advantage when you uh, are going in the field and you are sampling uh, matrices like uh, such as feces, urines, uh, and even uh, the hair as we previously observed. On the opposite, we are several disadvantages. One is becoming from the same technique, but is uh, giving us an advantage, which is ex exactly the amplification. Because actually, as a, if you remember, when I, I introduced the concept of extracting DNA from the hair, I immediately referred to the fact that also in your lab, you get a lot of DNA. And this DNA can be easily amplified by this technique, by the PCR. As I mentioned before, uh, the concept of mind, the gap, is not always uh, present in the different organisms. So for instance, in plants, you need to have at least uh, let's say at minimum of two, but much better having three different barcode markers. And 
even though your analysis in terms of bioinformatics is nothing compared to the metagenomic based analysis, still, if you don't have a good reference database, you might end up in very strange taxonomic identification. Now I would like to, to share with you uh, the, the, the basic concept of our reference database. Here you have a collection of different barcodes of uh, different products, okay? You do your analysis, uh, you uh, find this uh, result. So the, these three different uh, barcodes. Now you compare with a, with a scan and the scan is the bioinformatic analysis, your samples to a uh, reference genetic uh, database. So uh, this is generic. So it's, uh, for instance, you, you analyze uh, a single product, which is a specific, and then you compare this product to uh, what is present in a, in a store, okay? And what do you, you got here? Uh, your, um, there's no matching. It means that probably your reference database is too much generic. So it does not contain the specific barcode referred to the specific product you are looking at. On the opposite, if you manage to have a more complete uh, reference database, you, have a, you can have a 100% matching. That's the reason why it's so important the sampling. I mean, if you go in, in a field, uh, you go in the field, uh, if you go to some places where you can all, uh, we can, uh, you can have already uh, basic information about the kind of organisms you are expected to retrieve, I will suggest you first to create a, a custom-made reference database. What does it mean? Usually when we create a reference database, we, we try to leverage on what other people already did. So we download the sequences uh, deposited in uh, public repositories. But of course, not all these uh, sequences belong to the, might belong to the species you are interested in. In that case, if you know that in this particular area, there are species of a genus of a species, was DNA, was barcode sequence is not present in the public repository, it's better to invest some time and money to uh, perform an amplification of the barcode markers of that particular species, and then add this sequence to the public repository. So it means that you are completing, you are making a much better reference database in terms of taxonomic representation. And this allows you to have a specific identification down to the level of the species, okay? So this is uh, something uh, really important. Uh, sometimes people uh, think that just go uh, collect samples, do the molecular analysis, and then with a the comparison, you can for sure find the species of interest. It's not the case. Uh, it means also that there are so many different species out there. And, uh, and of course, not, not everyone has been analyzing so far, but in case, uh, I, I repeat, especially if sometimes your interest is in some rare uh, LOZ species, it would much be better to, to perform some additional wet lab analysis in order to curate your reference database. And now we move to uh, some application of environmental DNA. So I retrieve them from the literature. So, because uh, actually my main interest uh, now is working on something at the interface between environmental and ancient DNA. So probably it is interesting also for conservation applications, but I guess these examples are more in line with what you are, uh, you are doing. So this one, for instance, is um, it's a very nice study actually, because it's going to compare the performance of a molecular-based techniques for identifying species, environmental DNA metal coding, with a very widely used approach, which is the camera trapping. Okay, so something uh, I guess many of you are aware of, for sure, much from me. So this study is conducted in, um, in California. And uh, I think we can easily discuss the results. There's no need to, to go into the details. So this is a typical uh, Venn diagram. So you can have on, the, on this part, what you are uh, identified through the uh, camera trapping. And the other side, you got what you identified only with molecular analysis. Of course, it, it, is, a, it is a very reassuring fact. Most of the species are common. There is a strong complementarity between the two approaches. But still, you can have a lot of species that were undetected with camera trapping, but you can detect them through 
a molecular analysis. And you can see also a very, uh, of course, there's also a quite interesting fact is it refers directly to what I told you at the beginning. These are not species occurring in these areas. The results are coming from contamination. This is something is, is really uh, almost impossible to get rid of. The only thing you could do and you should do, in my opinion, you must do, is to check within your experiment for the occurrence of contamination. You can do that. There are several techniques to do that. Uh, I would say uh, before uh, the last couple of years, a lot of people were very easy, easy going. So just uh, the, the detection of uh, contamination were not, was not so precise in my view. Nowadays, uh, also uh, many mm, journals require you to provide many more details about the contamination stuff because you, you can easily think about the, what you are going to say. I mean, especially if you find a strange results, your first question should be, can I trust these results or is it just coming from a technical problem? This is the first question, okay? But, uh, and also you can see another uh, interesting uh, uh, stuff here, which is about the, you, okay, I think, uh, yes. You can see there's, there are um, two names for a single, uh, uh, image. Why? Because one of the barcode markers was able just to find the family, Canide, and the other one was much more specific and was finding the genus, Canis. Restrict your scales, uh, genus, and be so specific but you need a very well curated uh, reference database going back to the uh, down to the species level. I forgot to say, but now we can uh, we can come back to this point. This study has been conducted upon a collection of a soil samples. Okay, so you just go there in the field, collect the surface of the soil, and then you go in the lab and retrieve your your analysis, okay? Of course, uh, it allows you to have, uh, to expand your opportunity to understand the taxonomic composition of a certain area. It doesn't come at no cost. Of course, it's time consuming. It requires some, uh, some technical uh, infrastructures, but I would like to say it's not that expensive as you might imagine, okay? Nowadays, especially the, the reduction in the sequencing cost allows you to conduct a very well uh, curated study on a scale of, let's say, 100 different samples for a total amount of money, which is about 3,000 euros, okay? So it's not really as in previous times where genetics and especially genomic studies were so expensive. Now I would like to present uh, um, an, an example, which is pretty much in line with the previous one. It is more recent. Uh, it is about uh, tracking mammals occurrence in a natural reserve in Lebanon. And this is made uh, collecting scats, okay? So probably something many of you are familiar with. In that case, uh, 238 scat samples. The barcode markers is the usual for mammals, mitochondrial DNA, cytochrome oxidase one. Here, I guess the, the order would like to assess the fact that even for the same species, the morphology of a scat can, can differ very much according to the season. Uh, of course, I'm referring to what I, they, they say because I'm, uh, I'm not an expert of uh, of the morphology of, of, of the scats, of course. But just to say that even if you would like to uh, understand the taxonomic composition upon feces, probably is not that easy. So they, they tried to see whether or not they could leverage on the fact that anywhere you can find scats on the field, coupling this with a molecular approach. And they were pretty lucky in, in the sense that we retrieved a total of uh, 18 vertebrate species. Uh, 12 of them have been already reported in the standard, uh, you know, survey. Even though, uh, you know, uh, there are nine that were missed by the molecular analysis. This is something not unexpected again, 
molecular tools are not the, the magic solution, are a very, very powerful and informative tool, but would be uh, important to consider as a complementation, as a complementarity to the other already available tools. Sometimes, especially when you need to have a very rough representation of what you got in a certain area. And for instance, if you think about a complete and restricted areas for which also the, um, the entrance of human beings is to some extent uh, forbidden, you might think about using a, a drone for collecting a, a small part of a sediment. And then you can analyze the, the sediment in terms of having at least a first representation of the main different taxa. For instance, you can have even uh, a barcode markers for eukaryotes. So it's going really to tell you which are the organisms present from the uh, soil vertebrates up to mammals. Of course, it's very hard the case, but you can find the specific uh, the, the species, but at least for a first representation. So in other uh, in other terms, um, these tools are powerful, but need anyway an interpretation and need anyway some comparison with what we know from other sources of information. You can also see here, but in spite of using a barcode marker in theory specific for mammals, uh, with the asterisks are indicated four species, free bird and one reptile, but has been, uh, that have been detected by uh, environmental DNA barcoding. Which is extremely relevant, I guess, uh, in the study is the fact that since they, uh, they collected the scat in the, in the field, um, according to the different season, you can find also the different representation of the different species in the different seasons. So to some extent you can have, and this was what they tried to do in the, in the graph uh, with the maps, uh, you can have a, a kind of representation of a distribution maps, so the use of the, of the habitats by the different species during the different season. I guess, again, um, you might think of this also in a more specific terms. For instance, you might think of really uh, having an idea of uh, which are the main species or, uh, for instance, a, a trophic link. So you might use uh, environmental name metabar coding for assessing just the occurrence of the species you are most interested in, in terms of the trophic chain. But for sure is a powerful method because actually it, it gives you a lot of opportunity in a relatively short amount of time, especially in terms of collection of the samples. So the, the field activity, which is usually quite expensive because you need a lot of human resources, this can be done in a short amount of time. And then if the, the setting is already available in a, in a good lab, it's a matter of, uh, let's say, from three to four weeks for having the final results. And for instance, in, in that case, uh, this was, uh, this was um, a scat uh, misidentified as a belonging to Aina. And afterwards, they, they learned that this scat is uh, actually belonging to a wolf. Okay, so uh, again, some conclusion uh, environmental DNA can be applied for identifying species, but especially if they are uh, elusive. And again, the better your reference database, the better your results will be in the end. And uh, again, be aware that environmental DNA-based uh, taxonomic identification requires anyway interpretation, okay? So don't take the results per se. Uh, we always say that, uh, especially when you, you find something strange, something weird, please first check that it is not due to your technical fault. And only after this very careful check, you can say, look, I found this. Otherwise, you might easily end up in a in quite strange situation. I stop here, I, but I got also other uh, slides if needed to, un to understand better the application. And I think now it's time for some questions. Curiosity. Hi, Cristiano. Thank you very much. Hi. Maybe you can explain a little bit about the sensitivity of these approaches. 
um, when you take a sample of soil, do you expect to find um, DNA of any animal that has been walking there or it's just from the feces or the urine? And what is the chance of just because it's on a trail that we can find an animal that has been walking by compared to a camera trap? And the camera trap supposedly to take pictures of anything that moves by. It's just the animals that have feces or urine, what you would be detecting. And also thinking, for example, about water. We're trying to make a survey of otters. Uh, what is the likelihood of identifying otters in a water sample? Do we need a high density of animals? Do you have any idea of these kind of approaches? I, I can start from your last question, which is very much interesting, especially because the, the field of environmental DNA metabar coding has been probably for most of the part developed for fresh water. And so I think for fresh water, there is also a much more uh, standardization in terms of the amount of uh, the water column you need to collect. And um, I think uh, I remember some st previous uh, studies, the density is a problem, but uh, probably what is makes the difference uh, you can imagine is the, the, the selection of the right barcode markers in, in that case. Uh, for instance, if your interest is about a specific a, a species, then you might use also a different approach. Instead of just using uh, an, an environmental uh, barcode marker, you would like to use a specific a species specific marker, and you might use a quantitative PCR. In that case, uh, it has been demonstrated, but also very very low amount of uh, tissues can be detected. And so this refers also to your previous uh, question. In the soil, you expect to find, yes, uh, something left by like feces, uh, air, uh, urines. But for reason why, to some extent, it's not so, so easy to find out, uh, you know, this kind of, uh, of, of large vertebrates. But of course, there's also the chances, but, um, but the, these feces have been uh, distributed across the soil by some insects. So uh, they became part of, of the chain. So in the end, uh, I would say that, especially when it comes down to, to find out uh, very rare, which is under, uh, you know, one, 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 two percent of the occurrence in a certain area, it can be problematic, of course. That's the reason why at some point you should, uh, and it comes again to the sampling design, you should collect as many different samples as possible, even in the same areas. So having different replicates, this is exactly the point. According to this, uh, to this study, uh, it's, it's quite standard to have a difference between the molecular and the morphology based uh, that's results. That's the reason why it would be nice to have the two of them, but I repeat, for in some in some circumstances, is not possible. So, better go for a very rough representation. But the sensitivity problem is a it is a problem because actually, uh, if you extend, if you stress the condition of your PCR, what is is the, the certain result that you might get a lot of contamination. On the other hand, now the, we are developing some techniques based on sequence capture you know, the, the same approach as in an ancient DNA, and they seem quite compromising. You can really uh, leverage on the fact that it binds directly only to the species you are interested in. So in that situation, I would say that probably also for rare uh, species, so very, very uh, uh, frequent species, you might, get, uh, you might have good results. Thank you, Cristiano. Uh, I was remembering one situation years ago in Ah, sí. Thank you, Cristiano. Um, I was remembering a situation here years ago in Madrid about the, the possible presence of links uh, regarding a very sensitive issue about public uh, infrastructure being constructed and environmental impact and everything. 
and there was kind of years uh, with the debate about if there is a link here, not <laughs> um, how could be um, solved uh, using these techniques in, in this in this issue, for example. Thank you. Yeah, this is a very uh, this is a very peculiar but uh, very interesting case because in this situation you are an advantage you like to, 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 to find out a certain species. So in that case, you can really use the, the most specific barcode markers ever, which are meant to detect just, you know, the sequence of, uh, of the links with 100% matching. To that respect, you could go also for something that is more sensitive, like a uh, so-called quantitative PCR. And so what I would suggest would be to to have a, a very good sampling design in terms of covering a large area where the, the links is suspected to occur, analyze these different samples with uh, quantitative PCR essays. And I would say that if the links is there, at some point you should, you should find the trace, yes. Because actually the sensitivity of this method is really very, very, very high. And in that case, you don't even, uh, I mean, you, don't, you can get, rid of, of many of the problem with the contamination because actually you are looking for something that is just present in your links samples. Okay, I'm asking, are there any differences between the different, so talking about soil, water and um, sea, is there, are there any effectivity differences. And then a question to the audience, I think. We have labs in the Iberian Peninsula that, uh, do, do we have labs in the Iberian Peninsula that develop this technique? Sorry, <laughs> I would love to do in Spanish, but probably. Ah, uh, yeah, I, I can translate. Yeah, basically the, the question was about whether there is a difference uh, in terms of uh, results you can get from uh, soil, water, and, uh, uh, and air samples, for instance, and whether there are in Spain already uh, labs uh, that can afford to do this, uh, this analysis. Yes, uh, starting from the last question. I know there are uh, several labs, I guess also in, uh, in Seville, they are doing something like that. And in terms of the samples, uh, yes, there is, uh, there is difference. Um, uh, probably the best is water. And in fact, if you look at the, at the papers published in the, in the field, I would say the most majority of them is coming from waters because actually, and it's also quite, uh, you know, simple to, to understand why. I mean, in water, you can find something but it is going to interact so badly with your extractions. On the opposite soil, you can find a lot of humic uh, acids and a lot of uh, dirty, which is going to affect severely your uh, your analysis and uh, scats are pretty good uh, air is uh, quite challenging but still feasible uh, we, we managed to, to have a, a very good study on uh, sampling air for identifying plants through pollen and so uh, yes but what it makes the difference is knowing uh, the, the fact that according to the different matrix, you should apply different uh, protocols and different uh, techniques, especially for DNA extraction. I repeat, once DNA is extracted, DNA is DNA. But how you extract DNA from the different sources can make a significant difference. In order to answer Ramon's uh, question, and, and in Okay. Regarding the Davian Peninsula, I'd like to say that uh, in our research center in Seville, we just had a, a European project, AirShare, in the environment of the DNA for the last four years, where we developed several protocols, not only for fresh water, but also for, for soil and air, but mainly for fresh water. But even in fresh water, we are using, for instance, small pounds where the the, the species, the vertebrates uh, are going to drink. So it's not only rivers or streams, but also ponds where the animals like wild boars, lynx, uh, deers, and we, we got good results in detecting animals just go there for 
for drink. So this can be a quite useful tool for, for making uh, the inventory. One thing that I would like to stress that uh, Cristiano said, what is really mandatory for having this fantastic tool that is the environmental DNA is to have a good reference database. If we don't have the sequence, the, that those barcodes that uh, Cristiano nicely represent as barcodes as a product that we have, these barcodes that we have in every, every thing that we buy now. Uh, so we, we need the sequences. This is why we also implement uh, what the so-called AMBU reference database that is um, uh, 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 collecting uh, insects, butterflies, but also uh, uh, small mammals, uh, so all vertebrates and invertebrates, because we need to feed this database, because we, if, otherwise we won't be able to know what we are getting uh, uh, in, in the genetic data. So what, uh, so this is a good thing is that if we don't need Hundred database in each lab because this database will be available online. What I'm saying is that database, for instance, that we are producing is a database that will be, that will be uh, available every lab, and this is what I think is really important in the genetic nowadays. That is is more transparency, uh, not only about the results but also sharing the information among several labs, and this is turning this methodology, uh, uh, let's say, uh, that could be uh, replicated in, in, in different, uh, in different uh, regions and can be compared. But I think uh, in the Iberian Peninsula, Portugal, Spain, Sevilla, Porto, uh, Madrid, uh, I think we are already in a good position for, for doing uh, such works. Um, difficult question from a practitioner point of view. Um, I understand what, what Paolo and Cristiano stressed about the reference, having a, a reference um, for the species. Uh, as you know, the member states have to monitor species from annexes of habitats directive. So, and that includes a lot of rare species, invertebrates, mammals, birds, etc. Any idea if those species are more or less covered in terms of these references that we could actually use eDNA as a source of monitor? Ah, sorry. A specific idea, not really. What I can tell you is but um, there are several uh, efforts running nowadays in Europe. Uh, one is about uh, creating uh, an hub of uh, an international barcode of life, and a European hub. Another one is uh, called ERGA, European Reference Genome uh, Atlas, which is going to create reference genomes from many different species. Most of the species, they say, we say actually, uh, important for biodiversity service. So my uh, my guess is that in a, in a near future, so let's say in five years' time, many of the most important uh, species related to biodiversity preservation will be uh, occurring or in a barcode markers uh, reference database or even in a genome reference database. What anyway, uh, I think one uh, could think is, if you already have a, an idea of your study area, as I said at the beginning, and uh, that's the reason why it's so important what Paolo uh, said. Uh, in terms of technicalities, probably if you go to, to someone who is doing, uh, for instance, uh, genomics or genetics uh, since many years, probably he or she ca can tell you, yeah, it's not that difficult. It's just a matter of extracting DNA, doing a PCR, and that's it, and giving to the service for sequencing. Yes, it is like this, but as Paolo said, it's important to rely on people who already work on this, especially because they can understand from the beginning, look, so you, what we are interested in, these are the list of the species. And then very easily in one, two hours maximum, they can tell you, look, oh, uh, I regret to say, but probably no species is available in terms of uh, 
barcode markers in the public repository. What does it mean? It means that probably you should spend best your money by having even a single individual for each of the species and creating in the lab the sequence. That means that later on you can use environmental DNA. Otherwise, you spend money for just having a, a, a it. Uh, usually, you compare with a public repository and you end up in a family. Yeah, you already know it was a, a kind of day. You are not interested in knowing whether or not it's a, something related to the family kind of day. You are interested in a specific taxa. So, in, in the end, that's the reason why it's so important what uh, Paolo said. If you don't have this kind of reference database, if if your species is not listed, you should better invest some time and money in creating the, the, the sequence, especially because it's, it's something you, you do also for the community, because actually someone else is going to is going to use this data. And in the end, the process of creating the sequences of a single individual is really nowadays quite cheap, especially if you if you do in a in a lab, well equipped, it's already well equipped. So really, it's it's a matter of uh, uh, in the hundreds of euros for even ten uh, different uh, specimens. Okay, but it's much better to invest before on this instead of believing that just using environmental DNA is going to give you the results to your problem. As usual, you know uh, this field is relatively new, and so it has been expanding quite a lot in the. In the previous years and uh, the use of these techniques sometimes according at least to my to my knowledge it, it has been to, to some extent uh, very also naive now we are entering a phase in which the, the discipline is much more mature and now we are entering also a phase in which we understand but it's much better to 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 go uh, uh, to the different uh, specific labs very well equipped for doing environmental DNA. It's, it's part of a molecular analysis, but it's a specific analysis. So it's much better to rely on people with a lot of experience in that, especially in a lot of experience in extracting DNA from different environmental sources, like, uh, I mean, uh, people in Seville or in Porto, they spent uh, years in working with scats, feces, urine, so they know how to deal with extraction from uh, difficult uh, sources. Of course, even, uh, for instance, I always refer to the situation in Italy where uh, I know that some people uh, in the conservation field uh, address some uh, human geneticists for doing some research. And in the end, nothing really special came, came out of this. Because actually, for instance, for them, the problem of having good DNA is not a problem. <laughs> they, they can have all the DNA they want from, from cell lines, from blood. But for us, it can be really you know, the biggest problem. I mean, DNA can be extracted also from ancient specimen. I'm, I'm working on that, but it's really uh, challenging. It's really tricky. So don't trust the people who say, oh, it's very simple. Just, just give me a sample. <laughs> no. and, and the sample is the most important part of your experiment. So please don't do samples to, to anyone, to the first one who claim to do uh, good genetics. It has to, 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 do, to deal with the, gene, the conservation genetics. So it has to know the technicalities and the, the pros and cons of the different approaches and the limitations, especially the limitations, okay? For some species, it's going to be very, very unfeasible. You can get a good result because the, the species is so elusive, is so rare in your environment. And so it, it means that you should go for a different approach. But you know, you, it's not you, but you, you should say, look, I would prefer quantitative PCR instead of whole genome sequencing instead of that. It's a good, uh, that's the reason why we are trying to, to create, to establish this network of people doing research. So the labs and people like you doing conservation and management, try to, to match the two, the two fields, okay? And I, nowadays, especially in terms of, you know, there are several more restrictions for sending materials. So that's the reason why it's so important to have the good contact with a good person, because actually you can really understand which are the main steps to be conducted in order to have a successful study. Um, we have a question coming from the, from the online audience. Um, Maria Balcazar asks if is this technique used to discover new species in particular taxonomic groups? No, it can be applied to, to any kind of organism provided you got the sequence.
cancer of organisms already deposited, or you want to create, for instance, if you want to, to perform an environmental dynamic barcoding on viruses, you could do that. But of course, you need to have a good representation of different viruses sequences. It's universal. That's the reason why it's so, it's so popular nowadays. <laughs> Hello. Uh, just a comment, uh, stressing what you already said, that, that, that the, the need for the expertise in treating with heart to deal with samples, samples to, to extract, to, and also the danger of contamination that, that, that comes. And even bigger when, when, when you use these kind of diagnostic species specific primers, markers, because, uh, it, okay, you increase the sensitivity a lot, but first you have to be sure that it's really specific to your target. And then uh, the specificity, or the sensitivity comes with a drawback of uh, risk of contamination. The more sensitive it is, the, the easier it is to, to have a false positive coming from contamination. So, so it's, it's critical that this specifically, this diagnostic primers, when you focus on a species and, and apply a test that is present or absent, or positive or negative, it's critical to have a strict control of contamination. Otherwise, you, you end up having a lot of false positives. And that may have been the case with the links in, in Madrid, maybe. And then it's critical to, to test raw nets of techniques they are applying to verify those with other laboratories or, or at least demonstrate that what you're trying to find, uh, the design of uh, the assay you're proposing to, to do is finding what you, you're Searching for, not. Uh, yeah, I completely agree with that. And, and, and I mean, I was surprised to see probably some of you know this this guy uh, S.K. Villers and uh, people working in the DNA field. They made a specific experiment just for controlling the, the occurrence of contamination in a clean room lab, which is a lab that in theory should be 100% contamination free. And actually, they discovered a lot of sequences coming from probably the reagents from the plastic used for the tubes. So it's contamination, I would say, is always present. What you could do is to check for contamination, as uh, Jose said. And that's the reason why you, you should tr trust only people working in this specific area, because uh, they know how to deal with contamination in, in the sense of how to check for contamination, not to, to avoid or to, to get rid of completely of contamination, because it's almost impossible. But especially when it comes to, to, to say, look, uh, uh, you have to say whether or not this is a uh, a wolf, uh, otherwise uh, the people can be sued for damage. Uh, this is not like, uh, you know, it, it, it really requires you to be very strict to some, to some procedures and not everyone is aware about this, uh, the, the contamination issues in, in the field, but that's true. I think we can discuss this this afternoon on the detection on the, of of uh, prey items, which which predator killed the prey, etc. Because I think this issue of contamination is also very relevant there. Um, but the same principles apply because it's also a kind of environmental sample because you have an over uh, uh, presence of, of your prey DNA and, and just a tiny, tiny amount of your predator DNA very often. Hi. I just wonder if you have uh, any opinion on the impact of uh, yeah, the, the DNA barcoding on the classical taxonomy. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I, I got opinion and it's a quite hot topics nowadays. And um, hey, it's, a, it's a big problem because actually it, it refers to the species concept. This is exactly the main issue there. And um, what I can say from, from my side is that 
what we are severely risking now is that people won't no longer do classical taxonomy, which is really a pity because actually we need Bowser specimen. <laughs> if you want to say, but a certain sequence belongs to a certain species, you need to have the Bowser specimen of that species. Okay. So according to me, it can be the other way around. I mean, I know that there are there is a tendency, especially in the molecular field, to overinflate the number of different species, which I think is not is not good also for a very you know simple reason Some, sometimes you just discover a species by molecular analysis and you should say immediately but, but the species probably is already uh, vulnerable or endangered because actually you find it uh, in, in a very peculiar area where you know there are several pressures so in the end uh, mm, there's no of course silver bullet for resolving this issue but of course uh, I think several times people who apply uh, quite, uh, you know, uh, on a dogmatic uh, way of reasoning, uh, these molecular approaches tend to don't understand one major uh, point, which is the intra-species diversity. So sometimes what you, you think is a different species is probably a different population of a certain species. So in the end, uh, taxonomy is still very, very much important. And uh, I fear now we are, uh, you know, we are risking of not having good taxonomists. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, we are done with the uh, presentation of this morning. We will come back at 3.30 with practical case studies presentations. Um, goodbye for a while <laughs> to the people online and people that it's on, on board. Uh, we will talk a little bit about some practical issues for the day, okay? So don't move, please. <laughs>